Um, my name is Torben. I work at a company called Engineard. A few of you may know them. And I talked today about how to, how to bring JavaScript and Ruby together and how this has already been done today. You can just use it. And yeah, mostly I want you to, all of you encouraged to, to play with JavaScript and Ruby because it's so cool, it's so easy. And yeah, it just feels like magic sometimes. Okay, so this talk will be very hands-on. I tried to move this podium a little so I can see the screen and at the same time type and show you things. But I hope it doesn't get too much behind the podium. All right, so what is this all about? Mostly the talk is split in two parts. So um, in the first part, I would like to talk to you uh, talk about JavaScript and Ruby, how, to, how they interact with each other and how you can like use the power of each other in the in each other. So yeah, what use JavaScript. Sorry. What is the cloud like? Louder. Okay, I, I will shout in the mic. That's no problem. So, how to use JavaScript and Ruby together is the first part, and then the next part will be more about small things. So I gave this talk, a similar talk, um, in May, and this was mostly the first part only. So I put all the things I've learned since, uh, since then in the second part, which is not too much about really the language level being interacting, but like how you can use JavaScript and Rails so cool with new Red 3.1 asset pipeline, and how you can use client-side templates to, to enhance whatever you're doing and stuff like that. So that's the second part. Yeah, you will see that. So but first, why would you do all this? And why would you like to, to use JavaScript and Ruby together? Um, for me personally, we got in touch with that last year as I was still working at my own company in Germany. And um, we had a client project which was pretty interesting because they had like this big web application um, where they were managing all the data. But on the same time, they had um, the requirement to have a client-side application for some of their employees going on the road in their cars um, which can't rely on internet connections. So what we built was um, a web application too, but it was HTML and JavaScript only. It ran like in a standalone Chrome installation on, on Windows laptops. So this was the first time I really got in touch with writing huge amount of JavaScript, real like, like applications, not only like view decorations as we've done it all before with jQuery and stuff. Like this was a real JavaScript application. And what we encountered there was we were writing a lot, tons of code, like twice in JavaScript and in Ruby. And this is, as we all know, not the best approach to, to code and to do all the stuff. Yeah, so this is a little bit background how I got to there. Till then, um, yeah, I moved to Engineard and there we're like at the moment shifting a lot of our views to, to client side views. So we get like better performance, especially for large sites and we can update easily parts of the sites, a little bit like the stuff Nick was talking about, but like all on client side instead of Ruby. So that's just, why it could be interesting. And other than that, it's just a hell of a lot of fun to have and see how JavaScript runs in Ruby. So if you're not really having this, um, this requirement, still play with it, it's cool. Okay, so I will get here and show you like um, the first things. How many people of you have ever tried to, to run JavaScript code from Ruby? Okay, quite a few, so that's, that's cool because it's, Really, really easy. Okay, this is going to be interesting. Um, there's a project called um, XXJS, which is just a wrapper around several different JavaScript engines, which are all run in Ruby. So if you just want to fire up some, some JavaScript in your Ruby code, this is um, the best way to do it because it's so easy. There's nothing really special about this IB session. It's just, um, just loaded the the gems, so require it. And then, oh, I can go on from there. So what I write here is JavaScript and will be interpreted by some JavaScript engine. And um, XXJS will just figure out which to use. So okay, wow, five plus five equals 10. That's not too exciting, but um, let's get a little bit more crazy. So to see that this is really um, some kind of, of JavaScript going on here. So, 
Oh, oh fuck. Okay, so this is working. This is really JavaScript. You can't do really a lot with XXJS as far as I'm concerned because this is mostly all you can do. Just run JavaScript from there. You can evolve files and stuff like that so you don't have to have large strings in your application, but that's it. If you want to get a little bit more powerful, you can pick one of those engines that XXJS is using in the background. So um, we've played a lot around with um, V8, the, the Google JavaScript engine, which has a pretty nice wrapper called the Ruby Racer. Um, written by Charles Lowell, who's Cowboy D on, on Twitter. Some of you may know him. Um, and this is pretty cool stuff. So if you want to do this, just require V8. And I mean, it, oh, I stopped shouting. Um, we're creating a context here, a JavaScript context, which will be interesting later on. So this is our context. And now we can do basically the same stuff here. Okay, still not so interesting. Oh yeah, it's context. Okay, it's 10. But what's getting cool here is what we can do is this. So basically the same function we um, had before. And now what we are getting back is a function. So if we assign this to some variable and just play around with it, we see that it's a V8 function. So this is really a wrapper into the JavaScript engine and we have now a JavaScript function in our Ruby code. And if you want to call it, it's no problem. You can just call it with some value and it will give us back the result. And this works the same with so many things like arrays, objects, JavaScript objects, Ruby hashes, it's all wrapped up and passed through languages pretty easily. So um, what else can we do? For example, imagine we have something like this. Yeah, okay, never mind. I'm sorry for the slow typing, it's hard with one hand. So now we can inject this class, which is Ruby code, into the JavaScript context. And then, use it from inside JavaScript. So if we now call logger.1, it will exec um, Ruby code. So you see, they're, they're the warning. That's the warning. So okay, this is this is pretty cool in my opinion because I've never seen like this smooth op uh, interoperation of two languages with each other. Okay. So um, you might ask, what what about Speedwise about this? And we compared this a few times, and I get so different results about how those JavaScript in Ruby performs. But V8 is really blazingly fast. And um, I've never seen it to be slower than Ruby if you're coming to, to things like number crunching. So what I've prepared is a oh yeah. I've prepared a small benchmark here. Um, not here, but here. So what this is doing is just like measuring the time it takes to calculate uh, all prime numbers to 250,000 in a Ruby version, and then the same thing down here using the V8 context, and then using a, a JavaScript version. So this is like a very naive um, prime, prime function. It's the same code. It's not like, a different, like any difference between it, it's the same code. And if I run this, no. It will take some time, and then you see they're getting the same results on, on the top and the bottom, and then um, the JavaScript thing is just two times faster. This is Ruby 1.9. We had results like eight times speed improvement with JavaScript when using Ruby 1.8, so this is really fast. And I mean, I don't know, we are not doing so much number crunching in our applications nowadays if you're coding Ruby, I guess, but if you have something, this may be even an option to just speed things a little bit up. 
Okay, so, but now get, let's get to the, to the part of getting our code dry again. So I've, sorry, I've created a small demo for this too, which is not beautiful, but it works. So this is a um, pretty standard time tracking tool, and what you can do is, is sign up, and as you can already see here, it has a funky new feature which is called validations. So you can sign up with an empty, um, with an empty email or username. So as you all may have expected, this is just validating inside of, uh, of the Ruby class. But what really happens, um, if you look at the network traffic here, refresh the page and just um, look at the Ajax request. Oh, maybe we should look at all requests to make it clear. So whenever I hit this, there is no network traffic going on. So why is that? Pretty simple, because everything we do here is, um, is done in JavaScript. So this is the JavaScript equivalent of the Ruby model I just showed you. Um, yeah, I'm not saying I'm a good JavaScript coder. It's just... Um, an example. So down here is a validation uh, method, which again is, doesn't use any cool um, kind of kind of frameworks to do the validation. It's all hard coded in there, but it's doing the validations on the um, JavaScript side, and then um, you don't have to do this round trip to the server and whatever. But this is pretty messed up, right? Because this validation can be totally different from the validation um, on the on the server side. So what do we do about this, and how do we like dry these things up? As we have seen, it's pretty easy to share code between the two languages. So um, a pretty simple solution would be to, to get the validations done in JavaScript and then just use them from Ruby. And this is exactly um, what we're doing next. But first, um, how do we do it? Because like in Ruby, we have a pretty good packaging system. We can spread our code in modules and whatnot and then require them or include them in our classes. JavaScript really does not have this kind of functionality out of the box, but what some pretty smart guys came up with is CommonJS, which tries to be the standard library for, for JavaScript, which is not there. And um, it, it's kind of from a server side, but it had so many different aspects to it. But one of the things CommonJS is, is doing is like um, having a spec for requirement and, and dependency management system for JavaScript modules, which is called CommonJS modules. And I'll just show you how it looked like. So this is a, this is a CommonJS module. It's basically there are three files. On the top you have like a very simple file um, with just one function. It doesn't have any dependencies. So this is a, the, the most plain file you can ever get. And what CommonJS does, in every module you have, it gets you this exports object. So whatever you add as a property to this exports object will be accessible from wherever you require this module later on. You see this in the next file, the increment.js. In the first line they say, okay, add equals require math dot add. So what require math does is just like include somehow the, the first file and then returns the exports object as its return value. So in, in this case, in the increment.js, we only need one function from it, so we're assigning only the add function. But we could, if in the first file there were like 100 of functions all added as properties to the exports um, object, they would be all accessible now in increments.js. Yeah, so, and the last one then is requiring increments.js using the, incre uh, the exported increment function and then adds one to one, which makes two. Not so exciting stuff, but it's pretty cool that it all, does all this dependency management and it, you only have to require increment and then it, it requires math.js too. Not fancy, but JavaScript does not have such things out of the box, so I'm glad that it's there. And um, yeah, one little bit tricky thing is, this is cool on server side because you just can code up some system that does this. When it gets tricky is in the browser because it's always hard to load um, to load JavaScripts, wrap them in a context so that you can have this export um, export object inserted there. They can add stuff like that. So the most beautiful solution we found is really to do all this on the server side. So before you like um, deploy your application or maybe do this live, so that you can wrap up all your CommonJS modules 
in, into file uh, into one big file and let some gem, some system, some library handle how they all are resolved and, and built together. I will show you um, this next. So back to the time tracking application. And let's enter the Wonderland. Okay. So if we're now looking at the employee classes, this is the JavaScript equivalent. So what you see here is it still has the validates method, but it's not the whole chunk of validation code in here. It says something about the employee validator and then has obviously some kind of callback down here which just takes a field and, uh, and an error and a message and then adds it to the errors of the current employee. Where does this come from? It's pretty straightforward. We use a, a gem here called modular, which does exactly what I described before. This wraps all your CommonJS modules into one big file, then can just deliver this to the browser and everything is good. The downside of that is that it's not maintained so good anymore. So this is RAID uh, 318. It works there. I'm not so sure if it will work with um, RAID 3.1 and the asset pipeline. But I guess there will be different approaches that do this in the same manner. So for this, uh, in this case, we just have a modules JS, which exactly does this, what I've, what I've told you before, like the require statement, and we now have an employee. Employee by data file, which has all the code back in it, which was before in the employee JS. So it's just like we moved the code a little bit around, um, JavaScript-wise, and now have like this callback instead of doing all the um, all the error handling and pushing it to the right place in the model. But what's really cool is if we go back to the Ruby code, we use a gem called include.js. Um, Andreas Haller is written, friend of mine. This is just one approach to, to again, one approach to include CommonJS modules in Ruby code. There are different approaches. There's one new approach um, coming from Charles Lowell, the author of the Ruby Racer himself. Um, I'm not true, sure if it's, it's mature yet, but I'm pretty excited because I think he writes good code and this might get the standard way of, of including CommonJS modules in RAIDs. But at the moment, include.js is working and all it does, I mean, it's the same require statement. There's some place in the application where you set the root path of all your JavaScript modules and then you just require them and that's it. So what we have here is actually a JavaScript um, function from the V8 context, which we can use here. And you see, I just pass in a lambda in here so this is what gets called in the validator as a callback. So whenever this callback, blah, 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 is, the, is in here, this calls this lambda and passes two um, attributes to it. Yeah, so um, this is not beautiful. We got rid of all the um, cool validations Rails has in it. But it's just an example of how you can like move your code in a module and then use it from two languages at a time without really um, getting any headaches about it or something like that. So let's move on. Uh, yeah, so now as good developers, we're always eager to test all those things. So we have, until now we don't have any tests for, for the, um, for the um, employee validator, which is not that good because especially if we write all the validations by hand and don't use any framework, we might want to test them. So what we've been using for, for JavaScript testing is um, a library called Jasmine, which is developed by Pivotal Labs and really does look so similar to RSpec that it's hard to, not to mix them up at a time. And uh, again, yeah, this code. So back to the code. This is uh, Jasmine adjustment spec, so it really looks a little bit like our spec. It, of course, has all the JavaScript things in it that you can just neglect if you're using Ruby, but it's very similar. This one is just some mock for the callback the, um, that the validator uses, and then we are trying to, um, to use the validator with some employee which does not have an email address, and this is like, okay, now the last call should have an error field set to, to um, email. And down here, okay, we, we reset our last call thing, 
then we validate an employee which has an email address, and then we expect the, the last call not to be done at all because this is a valid thing. So what, what you normally would do with Jasmine now is run this spec in a browser. Jasmine has a pretty cool HTML browser spec runner which can run your whole suite of, of specs and you can like spread the code around again, which isn't possible with all JavaScript unit test frameworks I've found, so this is pretty good already. But what's not so cool um, about is if you would like to integrate it with your CI. So whenever you're trying to get this into a CI server, you have to either you have to um, you have to find a way to, to run a browser like like a headless WebKit or whatever. But if you don't want to do this and you don't need a DOM, but only want to do like unit tests with your models, um, we have written a gem called Neophyte at Engine Yard. And what this does is again pretty simple. It wraps the um, the Jasmine reporter and the re Jasmine runner for the specs in a R spec runner or R spec reporter. So what you in the end get is re are results that look exactly like the R spec output and therefore can be just used in your CI system if you're using R spec already. And yeah, I just show this again. Never sure. No. Okay. Can you? Mm. Okay. It says. Does it, it says one example zero failures at the bottom. So our our specs are passing and. This is not very interesting, it, it just looks a little bit random. But if we, for example, get something wrong in here and run the tests again, yeah, it's breaking. And it's a little bit hard to see the stack trace here, but it's all, it looks like the RSpec, and you have a, like a complete stack trace of your JavaScript objects going back to the, um, a lot through the frameworks, like this is code in JasmineJS, but also to, to your, uh, where is it? It's going back to the validator spec here and stuff like that. So you can really see where shit goes wrong and if you have some kind of weird CI beautifier for, for the backtraces is all pr that your spec's producing, this will just work as well. Yep, and so <laughs> the downside is again, you don't, have, um, you don't have the DOM in there. So if you need to test a lot of a um, lot of your browser code and on what you can click and what not click and stuff like that functional code. Um, you have to get a DOM in there somehow. There are um, some people trying to to build something called DOM JS, which basically builds the the browser's DOM in plain JavaScript. So you don't need a browser anymore. It has this window object and stuff like that. I'm sh pretty sure it's not mature yet, so you can't really use it out of the box. But there are so many um, efforts in this direction. I'm pretty convinced that this will happen sometime in the future. And the good thing is like if you're using Jasmine and having this this um this browser runner where you have all the jQuery stuff and like that, it's so cool to to spec your um UI with it because you can use jQuery, you don't have to use some weird um cucumber or whatever syntax to to get elements. You can just use whatever you are using on your client side uh, frameworks or your client side code to to select elements and manipulate them and get their content and stuff like that. So you don't have this um, switch of context if you're going to specs. You can just stay in your JavaScript context and write specs right from there. So this would be really cool if in the future we could use um, Jasmine to spec our UI. So this um, is basically it for the first part, like the, the JavaScript integration. As you've seen, it's, it's so easy to do it. Just play around with it, it's cool. So let's get to um, to the next page. What what I really um, encountered every time I build client side JavaScript applications, it mostly is three things: how to get um, client side templates in there properly, without um, hassle around with loading them and get them into place in the browser and stuff like that. Second is how to get internationalization in there. We are coming from Germany. I mean, a lot of um, uh, US-based companies or English-speaking companies don't pay a lot of attention to to um, internationalization, but for us it's a big deal. We always have internationalization in Germany, so um, 
yeah, we would like to have it if, even if we are doing client-side only applications. So how do we get all our translations to the JavaScript stuff without rewriting them? And the last thing, a little bit um, similar, is how we get all our routes to, to JavaScript code because we want to, able, we want to be able to build um, JavaScript links, uh, links from JavaScript or just URLs for anything if you have a form or something like that. So you, you need uh, Rails routes to be able to do that. I'll show you how to do all that, but first um, some thoughts on the Rails 3.1 asset pipeline, which, I don't know, I was not so sure if it's cool in the beginning because I, I wasn't too convinced that Sprocket is, is the right solution for, for including a lot of JavaScript stuff. And even if there, like, especially if there's something like CommonJS, which seems to become a standard on the server side of JavaScript, I don't really understand why they, why they don't just go with something like that, but use Sprocket. But okay, as a pipeline, what it does really well is being able to, to, um, to provide something for, for people who write libraries and gems to just plug into this asset pipeline. This is pretty amazing because all the plugins, the things that do all the routing to JavaScript, do the internalization to JavaScript stuff, they all can just hook in there and do this pretty, pretty, pretty easy and a lot easier than they were, were we able to do it before. So, um, yeah, and you get CoffeeScript, which I really learned to love. But first things first. So client-side templating. Um, there are a lot of client-side template languages out there. We are happening to, to be using Handlebars.js, which I don't know. I shall show you some templates um, in a minute. It's a really, really simple templating language. So you can't do a lot of stuff in there. You, your views tend to be very clean and easy to understand. This has up and downside. It's compiled too, so it's really fast. But if you want to do any advanced stuff in your views, you have to um, export them to like helpers and stuff like that. So it can get pretty messy because like, it's not even possible to have an if statement in this template language with, with an operation. Like if something is greater than five, you would have to, to build a helper to do that. The only thing you can do in the template language is like saying if and then some true or false thing after that. So but still, I think it's a pretty good way to do client-side um, templating. And that's the one we are always doing. So, um, and it, it again integrates pretty well with Rails, which is cool. So all you have to do is basically, um, yeah, first switch the project. So all you really have to do is, is include a gem for handlebars assets, which um, then provides you with a templates folder under your app assets folder. So this is new Rails three one. I don't know how many people have have played around with that, but um, so in there you can have all this handlebars templates. And then another cool thing of, of Rails 3.1 kicks in, their um, JST engine or whatever it's called, if you are like, those files are all named .gst.hbs, so hbs for handlebars and .jst does a pretty simple thing. It let um, Rails take care of of a JavaScript object named JST which is attached to the window object of JavaScript and then just put every template you have or every file you have this JST extension on in this, um, in, on this object so you can just access it. So if I go in, so this is a pretty standard um, handlebars template, just uh, HTML code, here's something where you iterate over, over a few things. Then you have partials and yeah, not much to it. If you're looking in the partial, this is the way how you would um, reference variables or, or parts of it. So pretty straightforward on this side. And w how, how do you really use those templates? Because having templates is the, the easiest part. The tricky part always is how to get them into your application without dealing with some strange script tags in your um, HTML code and stuff like that. So what um, this gem does for you, if you go to some of the, here's the JST object I talked about. We can just reference every tem template using the JST extension by its path. And then this is handlebars. Handlebars, if you compile a template with handlebars, it returns a function. So you have this function, you pass in some JavaScript object, which is the model for the view in this uh, case, and then it will return a rendered template as a string. So this is what we do here. Just find the color list and replace its HTML in an HTML 
with a, this render template. So, this is really all you have to do. Just get this, this gem in there and reference it. So this is what it looks like, not too fancy. And if, we, um, if we're looking in the source, I hope we can find it. So this is um, all the handlebars templates compiled. As you can see, they will really compile down to, to functions. So it, there's no like in-place compiling at the time you're rendering stuff. It's all done beforehand. And if you would like to deploy this, you would just like prepackage these assets and it would be done all on deploy process so your, your app stays fast in production. Um, okay, so this is not too interesting. <coughs> but what you've seen, um, what you've seen here, is another cool, cool thing that comes with Wave three one out of the box. We have this JS samples object, and we have the colors object on this. And how's the how this is put together happens in here. Um, this is not only um, a JavaScript file, but a JS.erb file. So this is passed through ERB, and the asset pipeline um, takes care of it. So we can just use Ruby code in it. Not saying that this is a good I um, idiom to do it, like do all this code in your JavaScript files, but you are able to, to pull in some JavaScript code in there without hassling around. I mean, what you have to do before is, is do this in your layout, for example, which was always an ERB template, but now you can do it just in your um, JavaScript files and use it from there. So this is cool. And the downside on that is you totally lose all the context you normally have in your ERB template. So there's no request in there. You have no helpers like, well, I don't know, URL4, link to whatever, all don't work in there. Um, all you have is pretty much your plain Ruby arrays application. And I'm, you could write helpers there, and you could access your router and stuff, but you ca don't have the convenient helpers you normally have. All right. So this is pretty much it about um, client-side templates. It's not a big deal. And it's doing, so for example, the last application I did um, used some like pusher app notifications and stuff. And instead of rendering the same content on page load with um, Ruby or whatever template language you're using on server side, then getting notifications by pusher app and rendering things on client side again, you could just use only client-side templates and do even the rendering on the first page load with JavaScript. Or um, there's a handlebars a Ruby um, gem. So this uses the Ruby Race of V8 engine. And basically, you have access to, to rendering handlebars template from Ruby. So there are a lot of opportunities. Um, sky is the limit. So no, that's not true. <laughs> um, so next thing up would be internationalization. This is always like the same. You have this big, huge internationalization file. How do you get it to JavaScript? Again, this has been done before. This worked, I think, since Rails 2. Point whatever. But with the asset pipeline, things got a lot smoother um, and are now really nice to use. It's basically, again, the same deal. You add this i18njs plugin. This works with Rails 3 and Rails 3.1 at least. But if you do this, um, and then go to the application JS. You have to always oh, my mouse. Ah, this is now pretty similar to the one we've seen before, but it um, uses this T helper, um, which is not like something which, com which comes with this i18 NJS thing, but it is pretty easy to access it. But this is a good example where handlebars is limited. So the normal way to um, access the, the IETN from, from JavaScript would be like, like this. You have this IETN object which gets included into your page, and then you just use the T method on this. But you can't do that from, um, from handlebars, or you have to include this IETN object in every template and blah, 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 blah. So what you would like to do is register this helper, name it whatever you like, and then you can use JavaScript code inside there. And yeah, even the convenient things like this handlebar safe string, which just does all the escaping for the HTML. So yeah, so now we have internationalizations. And if we look at the co um, code for this page again, we see there's the internationalization file somewhere. Yeah, so here's the translations file, which is just a big object. And down there is our color setter, all the colors. Yep. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy, but it's, I guess, a good thing. And last but not least, 
this dude here. As you can see, it's not only blue and unaligned, it's, it's all links. So this links to some strange whatever, and this links to the show action of each color. And if we look at the, at the templates for this, no. You see again, there's a new helper. This is the block helper now. Every time something starts with a hash, in handlebars it's a block helper. You can pass in options in here as you've seen it before with the T helper. Be cautious. Don't do single quotes there. Handlebars only accept this, this double quotes. And okay, we're using the translations again and that's end of the link. So how does the helper look like? Again, just a normal helper. The difference is you can pass in a function here. So um, when we execute this, we have to find out if the ID is passed or not because as you have seen here, we don't pass an ID, we only pass the, the path to the, to, the, um, to the route. So we have to figure this out down here and if we've done that, we can just call this routes object which is included by the um, routes JavaScript um, library and either pass in the ID or not and then we build, we build a link and calling this passed in function here. So this is what, what is inside the handlebars block. One cool thing about handlebars is um, you could call, I think it's called inverse or invert. So if you do this, and we're going back here, we could have an else block here. So for example, if you're doing some conditional checking, we, we could write something like this in here and then some code there. So if you call this function just normally and, and just call it, then you will get the first part. And if you call function.inverse and call this, you will get the second part. Okay. And there's of course, like this is the new the color item which has passes in the ID. And then you, you can see this beautiful links. Yep. So I guess that is really it. We've seen so solved all the problems you, you often encounter if you're doing client side applications. You can do client side templates now, you can do all the routing in your JavaScript and you can do all the um, you can do all the intentionalization there. Also you can do dry code. So yeah. I think it's uh, it's pretty much complete. That's it? And ready for questions. All right. If you want to, yeah. Uh, what about server side validation like uh, Unicus or something else? Sorry? <coughs> what about uh, server side validation like Unicus, for, for example? Oh, what is I, uniqueness. I Validates uniqueness of. Ah, okay. That's a problem. You could, if you have like um, all your validations in, I mean, you, you still can have different validations in your Ruby file, right? You, if you can, if you're going back to this, um, to the project I had here, and go to the Ruby model, there's nothing that stops you from, um, from having different validations in here. So you could, for example, have um, JavaScript validations with does a lot of the validations and then but some extra server-side validations which only do this stuff that really needs a database connection. Or you, for example, could do AJAX calls for that. So I will have a two place for validations, Ruby file and JavaScript file, right? So yeah, we would we would keep the um, we would keep this this validator file we have on use in here and just I mean you can basically do this at the top and it will still work because it will do both. Okay, got it. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. So I think the question was if I can recommend this for production use. Um, to be honest, we don't, we, we have not used, for example, this include.js thing, which does all the common JS loading in Ruby in production. But it's maybe a 50 line Ruby script, the whole gem. So I don't know, I, I can't really stay, stand up here and say, yeah, use it in production whenever, but it's really a small amount of code. And I would just 
if I would want to use it in production, I would just rewrite it to, to be sure that everything is like I want to have it, because it's really little code. Yeah. OK, can I have another question? Yeah, so uh, this uh, I8 and gem uh, that, uh, no, not actually a gem, a JavaScript uh, library, I8 in gen for localization. Uh, does it load the whole set of uh, translations uh, as when you load a page? Sorry, there's, there's yeah. too much echo. Okay, sorry, this uh, uh, I8N, yeah. uh, does it load the whole set of translations? Oh yeah, this is, um, you can configure the, the hell out of it. You can um, split it, I, oh, I'm not sure if it's the route or the ITN, but you can configure both of these plugins, so you can, even for the routes, you can have like, this part of my routing file should go in this file, and this part of my routing file should go in that file, and only require one of those at a time whenever, so you don't expose all your routes or all your translations to, to your clients. And not, like, look at the readme, they're both pretty good, and it's pretty easy, but you can split up which is exposed to your, to your users and which not. Uh, the first question is, uh, is it possible to uh, use uh, uh, this context in several threads separately? Uh, I mean Ruby threads. So, what the if you have like this V8 context? Uh, uh, I mean exact JS context. Yeah. And then the second question is, uh, uh, what is kind of uh, is, it, is it exact file uh, uh, interpret? interpreter of uh, JavaScript, or it, it was written using Ruby or uh, C++? Or so, so um, I hope I understand it. So what is the, what is the JavaScript uh, interpreter written in? Uh, yeah. Okay, so there are a lot of different JavaScript interpreters. So XXJS uses just the one you've installed. It might use Node, it might use V8, it might use Ruby Reno, which is the old Java implementation. So I think it has eight or ten different things it can use. The one I showed you most of the time was V8. So it's a Google, um, Google V8 engine written in C, and all the gem in Ruby does is like proxying stuff to the C gem. This is why it is so fast. And I, I mean, they are, they could be totally different interpreters. If you like keep them, they all look really similar from the API standpoint. So if you come up with a, with a JavaScript interpreter written in Python, you could use it. But most of them are written in Java or C, I guess. Okay, no more questions. If you have any questions later on, let me know. Um, I'm also on Twitter. And if you have any questions or problems with Engine Yard, let me know too. I'll be here till Monday, so it's a chance to, to get some help if you need one. Okay, thank you.